the Carnelli Landscape Partnership, celebrating an ancient landscape. I'm not going to say much more than that. It's kind of uh, it's self-explanatory in some respect, but I'm going to leave it to Becca and Jack to kind of uh, kind of explain themselves more. But a little bit about the about the two of them, if, if that's okay. Uh, Becca uh, and thank you, thank you for for coming along and doing this. Uh, is the com community engagement officer for the Carnelli Landscape Partnership Scheme. Um, comes from Bethesda, Bethesda, um, and has strong ties to the Canada landscape, uh, having previously worked for any Ogwen and Patrenet, Pat, Pat, Patrenet, Teneriath, Ogwen, sorry about that, developing sustainability focused community projects. Um, and within the scheme at the moment, she's managing community projects, raising awareness of the Canada landscape partnership through well being and education activities. Jack, who's a co-presenter this evening, uh, is the RSPB Conservation Officer for North West Wales. Um, he studied zoology at Bangor University uh, and has recently returned to the area and developed a strong affinity with the mountains and coastline while studying at Bangor University. As part of the scheme, he's working with other, other people and the partners, plenty of partners, I guess, to secure a long-term future for Chuff and Twite. He's also a bit of a kind of a TV star as well. If anybody watched Country File, you would have seen him. Uh, sorry to embarrass him there, but I'm just going to, I can't, I can't fail. I can't, I can't possibly not put, put that in. Okay. So, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to, to Becca, um, uh, who hopefully is there. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there, Becca. Do you want to... Hi. <laughs> okay. Do you want to say a few words first, in it, by, then before I start sharing your screen? It's up to you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and share my screen and then um, hopefully we'll be able to see. Right. Can um, taking people out into the. I've started always at the beginning, at the end, which is not a great start. <laughs> there we go. There we are. Uh, shall I go for it then, Mark? That's great. Absolutely awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much um, for inviting us this evening. Um, as Mark said, I'm the Community Engagement Officer for the Canada Landscape Partnership. And over the next kind of three years, I'll be working very closely with all the communities in the Canada area, uh, encouraging more people to engage with nature and heritage through voluntary activities, community-led action, uh, school engagement projects and uh, so much more uh, and all with the kind of the vision to help these communities celebrate their home. Um, but before I get into more details about the scheme I thought I'd kind of take us back in time to discuss how the Canada was formed and um, geologically at first but uh, you know more and more by humans in nearer history. So for anyone that doesn't know um, this is where the Cadenada is lo are located. So it's uh, the northeastern corner of Snowdonia National Park, surrounded by the A55 in the north, the A5 to the west and south, and the A470 in the east. Uh, so it's a huge geographical space. Um, not only some of the highest mountains in Snowdonia, but several stunning lakes, historic forests, um, myths and legends. Uh, Llyn Colid is the home of one of the oldest living creatures on earth, according to the Mapanopion, and a, a handful of communities whose existence has been tied to the landscape for centuries. So the environment of the Canada is a product of its geology, um, altitudinal range, climactic conditions, and the past and present activities of humans. Um, geolog geologically, it's a mix of sedimentary and igneous rock, um, with the summits largely formed around 50 million years ago, um, and then carved out during a series of glaciation periods. Uh, and following that ice or glaciation periods, plants really slowly began to colonize the terrain, um, initially mosses uh, and lichens, but soon flowers, uh, including uh, a very special array of alpine species, um, such as the purple saxifrage. And then after that came the forests, um, which would have covered 
uh, the landscape up to about 700 meters altitude. And then people have been kind of in North Wales since the last ice age, uh, but didn't really become static in the area until about 6,000 years ago in the Neolithic period. Uh, this is when we started engaging in domesticating animals um, and that impact on the landscape became uh, much more visible. Uh, Minor Bath, which is in the top photo here, uh, is a Neolithic burial chamber above Rowen. This dates from this period, uh, as well as a lot of the axe making activities above Pemai Maud, which I'll get into a bit more later on. Um, the large cairns that can be seen on top of several of the mountains and which also give their name to the Cadena, they, they date from the Bronze Age uh, and were of extreme importance as, sign of ceremony, uh, as sites of ceremony for people of that era. And then kind of 3000 years ago came the Iron Age and Roman period. Um, and this is kind of the earliest dates known for roundhouses on the Cabinet Bay, um, with many of them found in clusters with irregular patterns of enclosure around them. And then came the medieval period, um, which was mainly concerned with seasonal movement of stock from lowlands in the winter to the higher pastures in the summer. Um, and initially with cattle, but then moving to sheep as the wool trade developed. Um, and with this kind of movement to sheep farming and um, the higher mountain residences or these circular huts or havotai uh, were abandoned as sheep, uh, sheep, sheep needed less people to care for them basically. And then since the medieval period, um, you know, villages have been developing in the valleys all around the Kanadai. Um, and they've, you know, they've not only been growing due to farming, but also the extractive industry, uh, including stone quarrying and slate quarrying and so forth. So this really is a landscape of change, um, not just geologically, but also in the way the landscape is being used by people who live here. And so the habitats of the Canada will continue to be shaped by changing economic and social practices for centuries to come. Um, and that's really where the scheme comes into play. So the scheme uh, became, was kind of born as an idea over 10 years ago and has grown in scale as more organizations have come together to ensure a positive future for the Kadnadai. Its main partners is the National Park, Katu, the National Trust, Natural Resources Wales and Snowdonia Society. But as well as these main partners, we work in very close partnership with a number of other organisations which have expertises that range from birds to outdoor education to community level heritage work and environmental projects. So the work being undertaken by this huge scheme is kind of informed by a large number of stakeholders, all with the kind of same vision of ensuring that the communities around the Canada can really engage with their landscape. And the, the vision really is that these communities can discover, protect and celebrate the Canada. Um, the, the plan's vision is really to open the door to create deeper connections with these communities uh, and the amazing landscape on their doorstep. And, you know, the lockdown really uh, underlined how important this landscape was for people. You know, we were extremely lucky to be kind of locked down in somewhere so incredibly beautiful. Um, but I think, you know, people are still taking these places for granted uh, and the, the mountains still face major challenges. So there's a great opportunity through this scheme to build on the enthusiasm and appreciation out there by enabling the communities to engage with their landscape. And the way we kind of aim to do this is through an, a, a huge array of projects which fall into these four categories. So we're, we're looking at access, we're looking at advocacy for the uplands, conservation and natural resources, and then cultural heritage and historic environments. So I'm about to take you on a whirlwind tour through all of these projects, um, you know, and, and hopefully you, there'll be something that interests every, everyone there. Um, and I've certainly found a lot of new topics that I, um, I love to learn about. 
So the access part of the scheme is lo really looking at improving physical and intellectual access to the landscape for local communities. So we're aiming to do this in a number of ways. So um, one of the ways we're doing this is looking at health and well-being resources and projects. So last year we de de developed two schemes um, to support people in building confidence in heading outdoors. The first was created in collaboration with Call Me Mind, and they were kind of easy, um, easy walks that started from a train station or a bus stop um, and had a focus on mental health and well-being. And then the second project looked to increase confidence in taking on more challenging walks. We found that a lot of people really wanted to head out into the higher mountains, but didn't have the skills needed to go and reach the higher peaks. So many of these walks um, were led by mountain leaders who shared um, tips and tricks with the walkers. And they were also conducted in the company of some of our experts. So Jack went on a few of the walks, our historians, our archeologists went along as well to share kind of their, their insights. And as well as kind of helping people reach nature, we're also re working really closely with the National Trust um, to engage in kind of sensitive improvements to uh, existing rights of ways. So as you can see in these two photos, this work is really essential as it comes to, uh, because it, it protects um, some of the rarer habit, habitats in the area. Um, the path on the left, um, people often kind of tried to circumnavigate the bog and ended up making doing a lot of damage because thousands of people were taking this path. So through re-establishing a clear and dry path, we were making sure that the habitat here was being protected. And, you know, making these sorts of improvements as well as making sure we're using good messaging, it makes, you know, encourages people to stick to the path and respect the habitats that they're walking through. Then when, when it comes to advocacy for the uplands, this is where, where we're looking at increasing understanding of the important features of the uplands of the Kavanaugh Bay. So most importantly, um, this, this, this work is being done kind of in, in collaboration with a number of stakeholders, and we're looking to build relationships between organisations involved in the upland management of the Kavanaugh Bay. So this can be... This is, these are organizations like the Canada Pony Society, as well as farmers, and just generally people who use and enjoy the higher slopes. The aim of this part of the scheme is really to shine a light on traditional shepherding skills, as well as the importance um, of, of conservation grazing in these uplands. Um, as well as um, that, we're looking at conserving the very things that the Kanevai are named after, which are the cairns located on the summit ridges and the mountain tops. Um, there are several misconceptions about these cairns, including the fact that they contain, you know, human human remains. Um, and it, it's true they did, some of them do contain some parts of humans. Um, but mostly they were sites of extreme importance for ceremonial reasons and, uh, you know, numerous artefacts, including broken axes and stoneware, have been found in these cairns. Um, worryingly, what we're finding more and more as people venture into the summit of the Kanevai is that these cairns are being tampered with and the stones removed and used to create shelters or for artistic purposes. Um, so through this work, part of the work, where you know we're looking to help people understand the importance of these sites, um, with a view of protecting them from further future harm. So yeah, we're, we're a conservation project, so it makes sense that we have a whole section kind of dedicated to conservation and natural resources. Um, in this part of the scheme, we're really looking to, you know, raise awareness of important species and habitats of the Kanevai. This is where our chuff and meadow projects fall, but I'll let Jack talk to you about those. Um, but, you know, naturally, as we're a conservation scheme, it makes sense that we do have a part of our project dedicated to trees and woodlands. Um, but we're taking a little bit of a different perspective and we'll, we're going to be celebrating not just new trees, but the older trees on the landscape. 
and we've been developing two micro nurseries in the area so uh, which are looking to kind of grow the next generation of native trees here in North Wales. Um, and with this increase in native trees, we can start to think about regenerating some of the local woodlands that have been that have suffered due to rhododendron growth or storms, as well as linking some of the woodlands in, in the northern Canada um, with low density planting. Um, we're also looking at, you know, supporting veteran trees. Um, there are two types of uh, kind of distinctive veteran trees in the Canada, which are large oaks and uh, small hawthorns and these large oaks were largely planted you know between 200 and 300 years ago um, by many of the farms in the area whereas the hawthorns are kind of naturally grown on the mountainside and can be just as just as old but no more than two meters high um, and, and these veteran trees have a really important role to play on the mountainside and um, they provide shelter and shade for livestock, as well as, you know, a habitat for local wildlife. Uh, but as these trees age, it's important that we plant the new, um, the next generation of veterans. So that's going to be a lot of the work happening in the next three years. Um, atop, atop of protecting our woodlands, we're also looking at kind of protecting our communities by focusing on activities that reduce the risk of flooding. Um, now, we're certainly not saying that we can solve flooding in the area, uh, but our aim is to increase awareness um, and stabilise watercourses through planting, you know, thousands of trees on water in low density planting on kind of watercourses on the on the highlands. Um, we're also going to be looking at a programme of work to repair areas of peatland, so uh, notably a site up in Gledfrud, which is in, here in this photo, um, which is a huge area of peat um, that is relatively unstable at this point. And not only does this really give a, an opportunity to stabilise watercourses, um, but peat uh, as we all know by now, has huge carbon storing properties. So, you know, it has this kind of double element to it. And then in our cultural heritage and history, historic environment project, we are looking to conserve, but to conserve in a different way. So we're looking to kind of raise awareness and record, record um, important archaeological features, as well as celebrating people and places within the Kadnevai. So I mentioned earlier about the acts works happening above Pemai Maur. So on the on the uplands above Llanwaid Bechan and Pemai Maur, there is a, an extremely rare and internationally significant landscape. Um, and this was quarried more than 4,000 years ago by our prehistoric ancestors. The rock that outcrops on these slop, slopes um, were used to produce extremely beautiful stone axes which were exchanged between communities uh, known as Gryglwyd Neolithic axes. And examples of these axes have been found across Britain. So they were traveling extremely far and they were extremely um, highly regarded. Um, uh, and axes and finds associated with, with this area are being found by people every day. Um, and you know they include unfinished rough, rough outs, um, which um, in the central picture you can see a volunteer holding one, um, as well as discarded flakes, which you know were, were produced during the production of the axe. So uh, last year we conducted two weeks of a Neolithic axe excavation with over seventy local volunteers on the hills above Llanvechan, um, and the discoveries made gained media attention because they re revealed that the work being done there by our kind of um, prehistoric ancestors were, was much more broad than we had really originally um, thought. So there's, you know, some really exciting finds being done already. And kind of connected to this archaeological archaeological work is the leader citizen science project that is being launched this year. Now, that doesn't know, when I didn't know at this time last year, LIDAR is a 3D photo or scan taken of the landscape from an aeroplane. 
um, and the process removes trees and vegetation and reveals a really detailed topographic model. And this can really help in, in identifying um, important new information about the Cavnevi. So as you can see from these two photos, which are from the same place, um, it's already kind of highlighting intriguing formations on the Cavnevi, which would otherwise have been lost to time under the bracken and gorse. And it means that archaeologists can go out and, and survey these places and, and find out, you know, from which period they, they were from and, and you know, we might make some really exciting finds. And then um, one, of, one of my personal favorite parts of the scheme is the Canada voices and place names. Um, so this really, this part of the scheme really looks to collect stories, place names, literature, song, and so much more before they're lost. And this is really with the view to celebrate the rich cultural history of the mountain and its communities. We've already hosted uh, a series of events, as you can see from the photos, um, where we invited community members to come in, pour over the maps, share their stories. And we've already learned so much. Um, I recently found out that you should never show your teeth to a frog on the camera, they, as, they, as your teeth will quickly turn to wood. Um, all that historically knights living in the area hid their treasures up on the Carnevai and that locals who found these treasures, uh, treasure troves believe they belong to the fairies of the mountains. But as well as these more magical tales, we've been collecting tales of farming practices and lives from the Carnevai, all of which um, we are very excited to share with you over the next years on an interactive map, which will be on our website. So keep an eye out for that. So, so that was a, an extremely quick tour of, of, of all our projects. Um, and, and, you know, all of these things that I've described, they build the core of the scheme, the central wheel. Um, but as I mentioned previously, my job and the team's job um, is to bring communities into the scheme. Um, this means that communication and engagement are intertwined to all the, the elements. Um, so we aim to kind of reach new audiences and help people to celebrate the Cadnevi. Um, so I thought I'd finish by um, celebrating a lot of the hard work that we've already done in the last two years. So one of our big target audiences is youth and schools. Uh, so over the last two years, we've been pulling local schools into our, our archaeology project. You can see the kids in the bottom right. They came, uh, a school Pantaretin and Llamavechan came up, all 70 of their year five and six students. Um, but we've also been going out to schools um, to, for visits and excursions. Uh, and we've been also been looking to develop some a series of key stage two resources, which will fit into the new curriculum for Wales. Uh, so this means children will be learning about the special qualities of the Canada from a really early age. Um, I, I attended a local primary and secondary school and know, I knew very little about this area. Um, and it, that's a shame, you know, it's, it's an extremely in, interesting um, and, you know, not just nature, but also history. A lot of our of, of Welsh history is embedded in this landscape. Um, so I've made it my personal mission to make sure that local children have kind of numerous opportunities to celebrate this landscape. And of course, volunteering is at the crux of this scheme. So we're, as, as I've said numerous times, we want, we're desperately trying to pull communities into the scheme. Um, and get them involved in this work of improving this historical and natural landscape. Um, so there's going to be volunteering opportunities across all projects um, with stuff such as Himalayan balsam removal, path restoration, Jack's uh, runs roost counting sessions, um, tree planting, and so much more. Um, but this isn't just a one-sided relationship. So we will be offering a certified training throughout all of our schemes, um, including oral history collection training, training in, lead, uh, in leader data reading, um, stonewalling, and, and so much more. 
uh, we're really thinking about the legacy of the scheme uh, beyond, and looking beyond the five years that we'll be here for. And we want to kind of empower the local communities to do this work um, and, and do what's best for their, their homes. We've also, uh, we'll also be employing three apprentices. Um, our first apprentice, uh, Aleri, is in the top left photo, um, smiling with a wheelbarrow. Um, really, this uh, she's been with us since last July and has already been offered a job um, straight out of her apprenticeship. Um, and that's really, that's what the apprentices were for, is to upskill kind of local young people um, and get them ready to enter the world of conservation. So we're really happy to see that that kind of is already doing what it should be doing. And then we've also got um, one, one of the greatest ways we're kind of engaging with our communities is through, Ma, through the community grants. Uh, we've been challenging our communities to think of innovative ways to draw new audiences into celebrating the Kamedai. Um, we've funded historical treasure hunts, traditional stonewalling sessions, outdoor education projects and art projects. Um, and I thought I'd just share this video of um, a project that we funded last year. The Kanadai inspired project um, was an idea I had for um, taking people out into the, the Kanadai to explore the nature, the flora and the fauna and then bring it back into the studio and using different materials and working with different artists produce work that perhaps they haven't been able to do during the lockdown, limited sort of facilities you might have at home. So it was about sort of re-engaging people to work in groups, to work as teams and yeah. and to inspire each other actually as well. So um, it's been an absolutely wonderful project to be involved with. We've had two magnificent walks every week for four weeks led by Jim Langley and also Dave Brown. Then these have been followed up with some workshops in the church hall with Emma Head who has been producing some wonderful mixed media pieces. We've had Mike Badger who's a, a expert in working with junk so he's made some recycled junk art pieces with the students and also Elary Griffiths who has has produced some wonderful work with the students using the photographic process cyanotypes. So we, we came up with the idea um, collaboratively, so, so working with St Mary's Church, Errol and David sort of gave lots of input in terms of how we might run the, run the project and we applied to the Canada Landscape Partnership fund and were successful in achieving the, the funding to, to support this wonderful venture. So as you can see there, a really incredible kind of art project that was funded last year and we're hoping, you know, we'll be running the grants for the next three years so we're hoping to see a lot more uh, exciting projects coming through. Um, we've got a deadline next week actually and um, there's some really exciting applications coming in so uh, really excited to see what else we, we can support in achieving. Um, Hopefully this will move along now. There we go. And the scheme is really kind of coming along in, in leaps and bounds, um, despite having a very challenging first two years due to COVID-19, we've managed to achieve so much. Um, we've had over 200 volunteers engage in uh, over 25 volunteering events. We've awarded eight community grants uh, and hope to fund many more in the years to come. Um, we've upskilled over 50 local educators through our training pro programs. Um, we've hosted over 50 educational walks and talks. Um, and best of all, we've reached just over 170 students in the area. So my dream of making sure that children in the area grow up understanding just how important and special this area is, is really coming true. And the, the ultimate goal of this project is to create an environment where communities can celebrate their home. 
Um, and we've created many ways that people and individuals and organisations can engage with this project so that communities have agency and have a voice in, in what we're doing. Um, so here, here's just some of, of the ways that you can get in touch with us. So if anything's kind of piqued your interest in, in this kind of last 25 minutes, uh, please do get in touch. We, we love to hear um, ideas and um, we, you know, if you ever want to get involved with anything, you know, we'd love to do that. Um, but yeah, see, seeing as I breezed through the kind of conservation part of this scheme, I will hand over to Jack now, who will go into a bit more uh, detail about um, what he's getting up to. Thank you very much, Becca. I'll just share my screen. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jack Slattery. Uh, I'm a conservation officer for the RSBB working in Northwest Wales. Um, this covers Areri, Penclean and Yenis Mon. I'm involved in a number of different conservation projects um, across Northwest Wales. Uh, and one of these is the Carnedi Landscape Partnership Scheme. Tonight, I'm going to tell you about two species focused um, conservation projects, which are funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund in the Car Nadai mountain range, which are focused on the Chuff and Twite. The Car Nadai is a really important area for both of these species. And through the Car Nadai Landscape Partnership Scheme, we hope to secure a long-term future for both of them. So I'll start with the Chuff. This is a really charismatic bird um, with glossy black plumage, red bill, legs and feet. It also has a unmistakable call, which uh, you'll hear now. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know if you wanted to hear it again, but um, you heard, I'd heard it again. Um, so this is an unmistakable call. And when you're walking out in the car, I you can't mistake that as it's flying overhead. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, the chuff is really common. Uh, well, it's really common. People think it's common um, when they go out in, in Northwest Wales um, because you can see it in the mountains. You can also see it around the coast. Um, and people often ask me why, if it's so common, why is it such a high priority uh, in this part of Wales? Um, it's green listed on the British Birds of Conservation Concern. So on the face of it, the chuff uh, is of a low conservation concern um, compared to other species of birds, such as the sandwich turn, which is amber listed. However, researchers have recently um, used criteria from the International Union for the Conservation of Nature red list criteria to define the conservation status of British birds. And they found the chuff is vulnerable due to its low population size. During the last national survey, there were 433 breeding pairs of chuff in the UK and Isle of Man. Um, when you compare this to the jackdaw, which, which has 1.55 million breeding pairs um, in the UK, uh, this is a really low number. In Wales, um, the chuff is amber listed uh, on the Welsh Birds of Conservation Concern. And this is because we have 55% of the to total population. And this equates to 236 breeding pairs in Wales. We're really lucky that in Northwest Wales, um, we can see chuffs in Anglesey, Conway, Denbyshire, and um, and uh, we can also, sorry, we can also see it um, in Gwynedd. Um, I think my battery is going to run out of battery, so I better go and get my charger. Sorry, everybody.
sorry about that, but I'd rather get my charger before I uh, before it might go blank. Um, so where was I? Um, so yeah, it, in other parts of the country, um, chuffs are really rare. So in Scotland, you'd have to travel to Isla and Colonsé to see it, and in Cornwall, oh, it's um, sorry, in England, it's restricted to Cornwall. So the chuffs red bill isn't just for show. It uses this to find soil, ground, and dung dwelling invertebrates. Um, they spend most of their time probing into the ground, looking for leather jackets. Uh, leather jackets are the larvae of crane flies. Uh, this is a chuff um, that was foraging on a heathland grassland mosaic um, near the Sugnant Pass. Uh, other foraging habitats include um, coastal heathland, uh, sand dunes, beaches, and they'll also use arable farmland. Um, at RSBB South Stack, some of you have probably visited there. You can also see chuffs using bird feeders and the warden, uh, Denise, has recently started feeding chuffs. Uh, well, not intentionally. Uh, the chuffs have actually just started feeding on sunflower hearts uh, on a bird table um, outside our house. Their nesting habitat, naturally, they nest in crevices along cliffs and sea caves, but artificial nesting sites such as quarries and abandoned buildings are also used. And this shows how chuffs can also use some of the human influence and take advantage of the human influence on the landscape. So the Carnivai um, is an important area for the chuff because of that combination of nesting and foraging habitat. But we found recently that the availability of suitable foraging habitat has been decreasing. And this is due to changes um, in management, which is leading to the encroachment of gorse and bracken. Um, if you can see in these two photos, I'm sorry, the quality is not great, but you can, you can see how between 2018 and 2021, some of the Oakland um, grassland areas um, have started to, to started to start to be filled um, by the gorse um, as it yeah it's just taking over. Um, so, coincidentally, some of the traditional chuff foraging habitat foraging sites overlap with scheduled ancient monuments, um, and they're also um, being damaged um, by the bracken and gorse. Um, as it starts to encroach. This is because their roots undermine their integrity. And through the Carnivai Landscape Partnership Scheme, we have been um, planning a program of vegetation clearance um, that will not only increase the area of foraging habitat available for shafts, but it will also um, prevent any further damage to the scheduled ancient monuments. These two photos were taken of the Anavon Valley, um, and this is also taken in the Anavon Valley and shows one of the Neolithic burial mounds um, within the area of Gorse. So vegetation clearance provides a really good opportunity um, to, um, to get volunteers out and about and contributing towards the project. Uh, this winter, the National Trust and uh, the Snowdonia Society have been collaborating to clear vegetation from uh, a uh, Neolithic settle settlement on Mole Vaban. Um, and as I said before, this is also a popular site used by chuffs and hopefully they will also take advantage um, of some of these sites which have been cleared from vegetation. So as well as um, the habitat management work, we're also looking to recruit volunteers um, to take part in monitoring of chuffs and their invertebrate prey. Uh, this will help uh, monitor the benefits of habitat management and also improve our understanding of how chuffs use the landscape uh, and invertebrate monitoring will also help us understand more about their diet. In the long term, this will help inform future conservation work. Um, Becker in her presentation said about how we've been able to engage in students and through this, uh, through invertebrate monitoring is another way of being able to do this. So last year, um, we had students from Bangor University doing a field trip, coming out on site and looking at what invertebrates uh, you can find in pony and sheep dung. Uh, and we're hoping to continue this as the project goes on. So 
by getting volunteers out um, and also monitoring chuffs, this will also aid the work of Adrian Stratford and Tony Cross, who have been monitoring chuffs um, in North and Mid Wales for over 30 years. They are involved in this project and last year um, they recorded 12 breeding pairs of chuffs across the Carnedi. They also ringed uh, colour ring chuffs from at least four different nests in the mountain range. And um, through the colouring recitings, we've already seen that some of the young birds from last year have left the Carnevi. Uh, over autumn and winter, um, at least two of the juveniles have been spotted on the North Wales coast on um, the west of Carnarvon at Dinas Dinkler. As well as um, some of the monitoring work they've done um, using more traditional methods, the National Lottery Heritage Fund has also um, allowed us um, to GPS tag chuffs. Um, this is the first time it's been carried out uh, in the UK. And this is one of the breeding females, um, which was tagged last year. Um, this is some of the data we've received from, from, from one of the chuffs. Um, all these data points were for, from one um, afternoon uh, in July last year. And it shows how many different foraging sites one individual bird can use uh, across the landscape and emphasizes how uh, it's really important to maintain this network of foraging sites um, for truff uh, across the mountain range. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the twite. Um, the twite's a lovely little bird, um, but it's, 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 often, it's often missed, um, probably because it looks quite similar to a linnet. Um, they're red listed on the British Birds of Conservation Concern, and they're particularly rare in Wales. The last breeding population of twite is found in the Ogwin Valley, which separates the Carnedi from the Glidderai. We've seen a, a long-term decline um, of this species, um, in recent years, um, and it's probably because it's on the southern edge of its range in the Britain. Um, a breeding survey um, in England in the Pennines um, only found 12 breeding pairs last year. Unfortunately, we're not, like I've mentioned, it could be linked to climate change as we are on the southern uh, and conditions are not are just not quite right for the species. Um, but understanding the reasons why twite are declining, we still haven't gotten to the bottom of. So the twite are granivorous birds, and this means they primarily feed on seeds. Um, and they nest, um, in Wales anyway, um, on the steep-sided slopes um, of the Carnedi. Um, and here you can see the side of Penaralwyn, and that's one of their um, favoured nesting sites. Um, so twite only inhabit um, the Carnedi um, for um, a short period, well, it's not really a short, it's at least half the year. So they'll be in the Canada um, in some spring, summer and late autumn. Um, at other times of the year, um, they move down from, from, from the height from the mountains um, back towards along the coast. Um, but really their survival and also their breeding success depends on having uh, a constant supply of food all year round. In other words, they need to be able to get seeds um, at different times of, of, of the year. Unfortunately, like the chuff, changes in habitat management has been has reduced the availability of suitable foraging habitat uh, for, for the twite. So as part of the Carnival Landscape uh, Partnership Scheme, we're working with different partners, work, um, such as the National Trust, and also with local farmers to restore and improve the condition of hay meadows um, and, and to ultimately ensure a constant food supply for twite um, in the Carnedi um, throughout the breeding season. Where, where we can't encourage um, hay meadows, um, we're in trying to we're trying to get people to get the farmers um, to have grazing breaks. So this means that just at certain times of the certain times of the breeding season, um, fields are not grazed for a ten-week period, and this allows um, 
this allows plants to uh, grow, flower and seed, um, which at least provides, so, uh, provides some food for the twi. We're also um, providing supplementary food. So when the twi returned to um, Ogwin Valley at, at, the, at the beginning of April, um, food can be difficult to find. Um, so by su providing supplementary food, there's something there um, for them to feed, to feed on. Um, we can also use the supplementary feeding stations for monitoring of the birds. And Kelvin Jones from the British Trust for Ornithology has been monitoring twi um, in, in the Ogwin Valley um, for several years. And as a result of this, we've also been able to learn more about their migration routes by putting colorings on the birds. So um, many of the birds spend winter on the de estuary, but uh, some of them travel even further afield. Um, so they have been found um, on the coast of Norfolk as well. So I mentioned earlier that the twite is um, a bird that's often overlooked. So last year we ran a bio blitz in one of the hay meadow restoration sites. And this provided an opportunity for us to um, share more knowledge about the twite and its biology. Um, we did a guided bird walk in the hope that we would see some twite. Unfortunately, we didn't see any, but we did have an opportunity um, to ID some of their food plants as part of the BioBlitz. Biodiversity monitoring is something that we'd like to encourage um, as part of the project. And by doing BioBlitz, it gives people that are less experienced um, in biological to get some experience and, and to take that knowledge and, and start doing it themselves. So just quickly before I end, I just thought I'd mention that as well as sort of the hay meadow restoration projects um, within um, the higher areas of the Carnevo, we're also doing lowland hay meadow restoration, um, mainly in the, in the Conway Valley. This isn't focused on any particular species, but it's just about um, improving the connectivity of existing hay meadows um, and trying to just in, uh, introduce wider biodiversity, biodiversity benefits. Um, that's it from me um, and yeah I've, if, I'm happy to answer any questions but uh, I think Mark's going to come on now anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much John. Thanks very much indeed. If you, if you want to kind of uh, un, uh, uh, stop, stop sharing that'd be great and I'll kind of appear and maybe we can Okay, that's fine. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jack. Thank you very much, uh, Becca, as well. Thank you. Very, thank you very much for uh, two very, very kind of different talks in some respects, but, uh, but both very interesting in their own, in their own way. I mean, the the, the 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 landscape partnership seems to be to be to, to offer a, almost so much for a lot of people, really, uh, in different ways, doesn't it? I mean, there's the it covers something it's, it's got an incredible range of, of topics really about the whole of the kind of the landscape it's quite difficult to to get your head around it all in a way and you, you manage to to kind of do that with with your talk really um, um uh and, and 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 jack's specific kind of like two species which is really and i was the bio blitz at the end i was really quite i've I'd, I'd written down bio blitz actually on my little piece of paper here thinking wildlife uh, monitoring and wildlife uh, kind of identification and recording is something which we which which we as a branch actually quite like to do and we're thinking of doing quite a bit ourselves at some point this year and we have done over the last few years but uh, so that's that was good to see are, are, are you planning more bio blitzes this year yeah definitely i think um what was what was good about the sites the site that we did at the bio blitz was um perhaps typically sites because of connections working with the National Trust with some of those landowners would be typically sites that people wouldn't be able to access. Um, so it was good. So it was a good way to encourage people to come to new sites and they're excited about the positivity of what they could find. Um, so yeah, we would definitely like to continue um, running them throughout the, throughout the scheme. That's good, that's good. How, how, how would people find out about those? Uh, I think um, they were advertised on the Carnadi um, social media pages. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it, they would if you sign up to our newsletter, you'll you're very likely to hear about anything that we're get, getting up to um, over email. Um, otherwise, yeah, we've got Facebook and Instagram and so forth. So um, yeah, I'd say 
uh, certainly go to our uh, to the Snowdonia National Park website and head to the Cadmere Valley section and sign up to our uh, e-bulletin if you want to hear about all the events that we will be hosting this year. Could you could, could you put the link in in the chat at all, or, or, or should I send that out later? Um, yeah. I'll 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 find it now and, and send it in the chat now. Yeah. Wants to get it, and I'll probably I'll probably find it too and send it on an email uh, after to everybody that's been that, that attended and if and some people who haven't managed to, to get to us if that's okay so that people can actually find out where to where to join in with these things really. Uh, anybody, if anybody's got a question, please please uh, put your hand up and we'll we'll uh, or put something in the chat or if you want to put put your virtual hand up, uh, you can do or you should show yourself on screen. Anybody got a question? Got some good comments here. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Before I ask another one myself. <laughs> it, 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 obviously, Mike, the, Mike Moses got his hand up. Uh, Mike Moses. Mike, Mike, do you want to, do you want to, you on screen? You are on screen. Do you want to ask your question? Um, both, both very interesting uh, talks. Uh, I just wanted to, Jack, I was, uh, intrigued by the uh, the idea of the twite supplementary feeding stations um can you describe those is it are they just like bird feeders or and, and what are the um, the favored uh plants that they 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 seek out for the seed for the seed yeah so you're completely right yeah so um it it um they vary. Sometimes it's just a bird feeder, other times it's just scattered on the floor. Um, but it's usually niger seeds, usually their favourite um, their favorite seed that they come to. Um, but yeah, it's nothing particularly sophisticated. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? But you, you put pop, yeah. I'm, I'm scanning Jill's screen computer screen as well as my own. <laughs> yep. Just check it out. I've, I've, got, I've got, if no one else has something. Oh, to... Janine. Janine, right. Janine, Janine do you want to, have you anyone asked your question? Yeah, hi. Um, thank you both for that. those talks. They were really interesting. Um, enjoyed them so much because I live in Dweeka Bulky, so it's um, local to me, so thank you. Um, Jack, I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned something about doing some work with chuffs and doing some monitoring of chuffs. Is that something that the general public can get involved in? Yeah, so I'm more just trying to encourage people. I appreciate if you you live on the doorstep, you probably go for walks um, where yeah. you're likely to come across chuffs anyway. Um, so I think... Um, on the one hand, I'd obviously like people to do um, surveys on a regular basis and cover the same routes. And it'd be nice to just get a sort of a idea of, um, for example, if you were to, to walk the same route every month, then you, we could just get a bit of a picture of how chuffs were using the landscape through each month, um, because it does change depending on um, the invertebrate availability in, in, in some of these habitats. Although the, the breeding pairs were found, um, found in the Carnival Mountain Range all year round. Um, so yes, um, if, if you're interested in doing in doing some monitoring, then yeah, please get in touch, or or you can get in touch with the email address that uh, Becca put on put on the slide earlier. Um, but even so, if you're just going for walks in the Carnelai Mountain Range and you come across chuffs, um, I'd love to hear about that because I spend most of my time out looking for them. Um, also, particularly interested in in the colouring recitings elements of it and seeing what birds are using uh, bits of habitat like that. So. I'd also, so any sightings you have, um, I'd like to follow up anyway. Okay, lovely. Yes, thank you. I'd love to get involved. That's good. Anybody else? Joanna, do you, do you have a question? No, no, it was really interesting. <laughs> thank you. I just thought I would uh, no, no, come back good. on. And... Fantastic. Thank you, thank you. I was just saying uh, pre, uh, prior, that uh, I'm an artist, but I think actually I've uh, been in contact uh, with uh, your organisation anyway, but spoken to the other gentleman that uh, is involved, Becca, in Clan Roost. Oh gosh, um, <laughs> it, uh, it's, as as we have twenty four organisations involved in the partnership, it could be it could be anyone. Um, 
yeah but you were saying the debt there's a deadline i know i've submitted because um i've just I previously had a welsh arts council grant and it's sort of my work's evolved into quite detail but it's about it's based on font and i'm particularly interested in the heritage of the, the Conway Valley, particularly Pema Maur and Conway, looking at uh, Llangelenin Church in particular and the writings on the wall, um, and also uh, mythology. And uh, I've just previously been speaking to Fiona Collins, who's a storyteller, and she's agreed to support me in this. So I want to put forward a project where we involve people in discussion, primarily about their experience of COVID and the isolation, as you were saying, how you relate differently to your environment and then sort of hopefully take it into a sort of um, storytelling sort of or poem session uh, and record it um, into clay uh, and then sort of leave it in places either fired so it'd be permanent or not fired so it sort of blends into the landscape but I'm, I'm, I'm putting these, it's sort of a work in progress and it's, it sounds a little bit convoluted, but I, I'm very excited about it at the moment. And lots of things you were saying about, I mean, I was, I was born in Glen Conway and went to school in San Roos. I've been away for a while, I've been abroad, but I've come back and there's this, this rich heritage, isn't there? And also going up somewhere like Penmamaud and finding these relics of the past, you know, this is the thing that's really exciting for me at the moment. So um, that's that's where I am. So hopefully we'll be able to chat, if not through the project, then another time. Do you have an address I can contact you? Yeah, if uh, I've just popped the email oh, of the scheme in the chat. So uh, I look at that every day. Um, I, I, I won't be in work until next Wednesday, but um, please do get in touch. Um, I love kind of chatting through our uncreative projects. So I'm sure I'm sure we can do something together. Well, it sounds, I mean, obviously I, I'm really excited about it, but I do need some support and structure to it because I'm an artist <laughs> and not very good at bringing people together. And there's so many really, um, you know, unique people living in that area too. It's a unique area, isn't it? But also very unique people with uh, unique paths. So I think it would be mm -hmm. really exciting. <laughs> yeah yeah well get, do get in touch and we'll definitely to... do that <laughs> thank you thank you we've got a, just a quick quick a question from Teresa uh in the chat i don't know if she wants to... jack actually jack you said yeah. that you don't uh, that people easily mistake twite for linnets how would you tell what you were looking at easily uh I think it does take practice. Uh, it'd be easier if I had two photos to show you the difference. Um, but I think, um, yeah, I mean, so so Twite have got have got have got a pinkish rump, which is quite distinguishable. They've also got a smaller bill, um, and in in um, summer months, this tends to be like brighter than a yellow as opposed to a a, a grey. Um, but yeah, and also have a lot of buff streaks um brownish buff streaks on it um which the linnet doesn't have and that's browner on the back it'd be easier if i had two photos to show you to be honest yeah. but, um, I'll, I'll i'll look at photos because only because you because clearly we're not going to see them during the summer but you said sometimes they in the winter they yeah you are if you unless you 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 could come across them on the coast um yeah because they so so one of the so when they come down from the mountains they'll they will use the coastal areas in North Wales, um, but what we don't what we don't fully understand is whether we think we're getting birds in North Wales that come in from elsewhere in, in the country, so they migrate to the North Welsh coast. Um, but yeah, I think we just they are they just tend to be under recorded. They're either under recorded or they're just not very common. Um, yeah, because because I think sometimes, I mean, linnets do the same thing, don't they? I mean, there's quite a few places. Sort of along the coast where you can actually see them on the coast so you wouldn't necessarily know that they were especially if they're in winter plumage as well that 
Yeah, yeah, and you could also have one. You, you, I suppose there's always the chance that you could have a mixed flock as well. So. <laughs> okay, <laughs> makes it even more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, e Evelyn, uh, uh, thanks, Teresa. Uh, Evelyn, would you like to give your question? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, um, Becca, you mentioned the cairns and and people using them to make shelters and, and sort of artworks and. Um, as an ex-archaeologist, you know, I can understand the, uh, you know, the, the kind of attraction of, of, of trying to preserve things as they are. But do you think it's possible to kind of preserve things too much? And, um, and that, so you kind of stop people interacting with the landscape and, and making changes that are, that are kind of a natural part of, of the age that we live in. This is a very good question. <laughs> I think it would depend. It depends uh, on a personal level. I can absolutely. I ca I kind of uh, agree with your with what you're saying. I think the archae archaeologists take a different stance, especially if they've not had the opportunity yet to um, research the cairn. And um, I think they would probably feel a little bit better if they'd had a chance to kind of scope what the cairns may contain. Um, uh, but yeah, you know, I, as I said, it's a changing landscape and, and people use this landscape and, and that's part of the story as well, absolutely. Um, I guess it's finding, striking that balance between um, preserving, but also um, allowing kind of natural change to happen, isn't it? So um, yeah, yeah. It's a it's an interesting question. I, I I'll be interested to see how the archaeologists kind of go about interpreting it, and and because we can't go up there and put a sign up there, so you know there's only so much we will be able to do. But um, yeah, well, I guess watch this space. <laughs> okay, thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Evelyn. Uh, Kay and Julian, would you like to? Oh, there you go. Good to see you. <laughs> He's muted. Oh, oh, unmute yourself, Julian. Sorry, yeah, thank you. Two great talks. Um, a follow-up question in a way about archaeology. Um, you, you both probably know that, uh, well, mention's been made of Llanglanin Church and on the, near the ridge above there, about half a mile away, is a very famous standing stone, um, uh, mine, mine, mine Pendy stone. It's a real landmark, and it's a very moving place, but it's been defaced by graffiti on one side, possibly 20, 30 years ago, but it's very persistent paint. And A, I wondered if you could get together with Cadu and do something about that, you know, with the right sort of treatment to erase it. But also it strikes me, you know, it's a very good PR opportunity, perhaps, um, locally. Is that, is that a possibility? It's, uh, I'll, I'll make a note of it now. Um, I'm, I, we're kind of in constant um, contact with Jeff from Kadu, so he may or may already be aware of it. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll certainly make make a note of it. Um, because uh, the issue is, where, when does uh, the vandalism become a historic <laughs> part of the landscape, isn't it? You know, when does it become part of the history of it? Um, but I, I'll, I'll definitely make a note of it. Um, and have a chat with Jeff about it, and um, you might you might see that it's been removed. <laughs> Great. Well, again, watch this space. Oh, that space. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Gina. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, yeah go on. Jill's, Jill's going to ask a question. I'd like to ask a question to Jack, <laughs> please. Do the do the worm treatments? Can you hear me? I don't know. Do the worm treatments given to sheep get through into the sheep droppings, and then would it be a problem for the chuff feeding on invertebrates, or are there a lack of invertebrates because of the sheep um, and the, the, the droppings? Will yes, it does. Um, livestock treatments will affect um, the abundance and diversity of invertebrates in livestock dung, and this has has been set, um, not 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 in Wales, but in Scotland, um, there has been research um, looking at um, yeah the the impacts of livestock treatments mm. on dung. Um, haven't necessarily been able to correlate that directly to chuffs, but basically like controlled experiments, mm. so you can you can basically how many invertebrates are in a cow pat that have been treated with livestock 
how many are not and yeah. what they do find is though is that the, uh, the the abundance of different species change so and that might be because there's less competition with with other invertebrates in the dung or something along those lines um so it's not always conclusive as yeah i, I can't remember the exact example but um I feel like it's, um, I, if I remember correctly, um, from the paper, it was done on Isla because it was linked to chuffs, um, was that I think the one that had been treated with livestock was higher with earthworms, um, but lower in, 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 in the dung beetles. Right, right. Yeah. Thank you. It's yeah. ivermectin. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, ivermectin. Yeah, ivermectin. Yeah. Is the actually, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. But what, what, we, what we don't know is any, what, and hopefully in contact with some students from Bang University that might be able to do some comparison of, of dung invertebrate monitoring and kind of compare those differences um because i'd like to have more research on that in wales yeah thank you i guess, I guess the livestock aren't managed organically in, 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 in any kind of way is that not encouraged or anything like that yeah um well it it, it just depends on on farm to farm exactly yeah um, i presume it would yes yeah that, that would be something to kind of think about maybe because because i think organically kind of managed sheep certainly uh uh, of a lower ivermectin i think usage i think i think it might be used but it's lower because we we've had organic sheep near us um uh and we have dung beetles you know what i mean which come from from there we're pretty sure so uh and so, some some unusual minotaur beetles as well some interesting species you know so it's, it's possibly better an organic management really i guess that's how it goes really yeah yeah I mean, a bit, bit tongue-in-cheek question for myself here, really. Like, yesterday, last night, we, um, uh, we, um, we, the Wildlife Trust had a, had a kind of a, uh, a YouTube kind of discussion about reintroductions, reintroductions of species. Um, would the kind of I present itself for any, any, anything like that, do you think? Uh, any, any reintroduction of a, of a species that might well have roamed the kind of I uh, in years gone by? Um, Oh, but that's something that's probably not even on, on the or agenda. Flown over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it's it's not anything that's kind of built into the scheme. Um, uh, we certainly would celebrate any of the kind of past species that had had been on 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 the landscape, but. Um, yeah, I think uh, the scheme is already quite vast without um, <laughs> building in an inter a reintroduction um, scheme. But, you know, I, I know there's a lot of, of work being done with kind of uh, otters and beavers in the area. So but that's that's other schemes altogether. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. It was a bit tongue in cheek, really. But it's just... <laughs> yeah. So trying to just maintain and, and you know, improve the landscape for our pre-existing pre um, yes. uh, species. I think um, it's, it's obviously a really interesting one when you think about the chuff because I think they 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 have had a perhaps compared to other species their relationship with human influences of, on the landscape perhaps have profited from some of that so if you think about quarrying it's provided providing nesting sites and also um, don't, we're obviously more than we're obviously aware that um, in the Carnival and other areas of the mountain range overgrazing is undoubtedly a problem but at, at the same time, um, chuffs have potentially benefited from that. But what we don't know is how um, is how the invertebrates are responding to some of those different grazing pressures. Um, yeah. So we assume that having lots of short graz grazing um, means that there's loads of foraging habitat <laughs> for for chuffs. But that's just, uh, in terms of accessibility. But we don't know if that you know if those areas are still highly abundant or diverse and in invertebrates that's fair enough yeah and hopefully with, with a few bio blitzes you'll find out more i guess yeah over time mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, which we could be good to kind of to, to actually continue those bio blitzes beyond the scheme really wouldn't it so i suppose it, i mean i know you've got three years to go but hopefully some of the work you're putting in place now you would hope to kind of for it to continue is that is that absolutely that kind of yeah thought? yeah so so the scheme, the scheme is entirely kind of focused on this legacy work. So um, what we're hoping is, yeah, that that um, organisations that that do this work, that we can support them in doing it into the future. So um, 
Uh, we absolutely, and I mean, Jack will certainly still be in his post, and uh, and I imagine I'll be knocking about somewhere. Um, so we, you know, we'll still be very interested to 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 find out the results of any bio blitzes and anything that's been done in the area. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, I suppose it, it often happens, doesn't it? Really, they, 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 it sets the scene, and that which hopefully it can continue and can carry on from there. That's good. It's a, it's a quick question here, which. Probably, probably results to me. Any, any, are you aware of any pine martins been been recorded? Um, and I, in the Bethesda, in the Bethesda area. area, yeah, yeah. I, I did, I did see someone had put up some photos from Braich Melin Woods of one. Um, I, I, but that was a couple of months ago. I, I personally don't don't know um, any more than that. I don't know if Jack Jack has any other more intel <laughs> uh i was aware that i think there was some isn't that, that there was some captive animals uh and i didn't know i don't know what the recent update is is whether they're still captive or they've been released um there were, there were some releases weren't they down f further south really uh that, that moved up red, yeah. red, 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 red squirrel around you ever said it's red squirrel uh did, did you yeah, yeah. Again, in Breichmel in Woods, there's been some some sightings, um, and I've seen some kind of some people's uh, webcams showing them. So they they they're, they are about the place, but they're extremely good at hiding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's, yeah that's interesting that they're spreading down. Yeah, yeah. From, from yeah, good. Um, question here from you and Gwen. Uh, how did we? How did you get rid of the gorse and bracken? So. Do you want to answer Jack or shall I? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty simple stuff as well. So in terms of um, volunteer work, loppers and loppers and bow saws, <laughs> um, and loading them in, loading them into sacks and burning burning that what's left, um, and encouraging volunteers to come along by bribing them with jacket potatoes and marshmallows on the fire <laughs> uh, at the lunch break. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. That sounds good. Um, and as it, and it's, you've obviously cleared quite a lot of that. What about the rhododendron? Um, uh, is that is that that ongoing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there's there was a huge chunk of work done um, last week in Dufferin Conway. So um, yeah, that's it's it's a it's a small part of the scheme, but still a very big part, um, big project. So that's kind of just being done um, by con contractors, um, mostly in Dufferin Conway. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, and uh, Himalayan balsam. Get you? Is, is there still some of that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Snowdonia Society is running a, a project of work for that. Um, again, mostly happening in different Conway, but again, as well in in Bethesda. Um, so they'll be running some consultation events in the next few months, um, trying to find the highest point in the catchment. Um, that the Himalayan balsam is located so that they can work kind of down, down uh, up and downstream. <laughs> um, okay. So that, that work is, has started last year and will be happening in the next three years as well. Good, good, good. It's all good stuff really, isn't it? Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you gotta really get on top of that, that kind of good stuff, haven't you really? Otherwise you'll just come back. Uh, that's the problem, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Just thinking, just just checking. No more, no nothing else in the chat. No, uh, no, 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 no Anybody else wish to ask a question? Be, um, I, I, I think we may have exhausted these two. I think at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think. Well, if there's no no other questions, well, please please just put your hand up if you you want to. But I'll just I say I think it. I think you do. I think basically you're doing a fantastic job bringing together what you, what you say twenty four different partners to all work together. Uh, and to kind of, uh, uh, did you all do you always all agree with what you want to do? <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, but the the thing is, like everyone, everyone's got the same vision, um, and everyone wants the best thing. Um, uh, uh, and yeah, sometimes there's some disagreements, but mostly, you know, the vision is the same thing, and we all know, you, you know, Jack and I. This, this is, we kind of love this area, so we just want the best for it, and so does everyone else. So, you know, you could, you forgive people when you realise that, you know, that objective is the same thing. 
Fantastic, fantastic. Well, well, I, I, all I can do is thank you very much for for for, for, for giving us two, two fantastic talks on one night, really. Um, which I've, I think I've, I think a few people have said already. Two talks in one, we don't often get. And thank you very much for that. Um, what I'll um, what I'll do is if um, and if I'm just just giving people a last chance to say thank you, and they are saying it in the, the chat. But lots of thank, thank you, you sir. thank you, learned thank you, so much. learned a lot. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, Jochen Bauer, indeed. Um, very interesting and a great presentation, Joch. Um, thank you. Um, um, if there's no one, if, any, if, if, if people who are left uh, wanted to kind of show their real appreciation, they could, could uh, they, uh, they could pop their videos on if they wish to, unmute themselves, um, <laughs> and we'll give these two a real round of applause. If that makes sense. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Becky. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. 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 Thank